Amy, thank you for taking part in this interview. Could you start by telling me about your background and experience as a patient? Well, um, I was uh, one of these, what I thought was a unique case of um, being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, otherwise known as juvenile diabetes, uh, in my mid-30s. I was actually 37 when uh, I got sick, and it was right after the birth of my third child. Um, so I just sort of assumed that I was exhausted because I had these three children under the age of five. Uh, but as it turned out, um, you know, I started to lose weight very rapidly, exponentially at the end, actually. And uh, my vision went blurry. I was, um, you know, experienced all of the classic symptoms, um, but of course didn't, didn't realize it um, until the last minute and ended up in the hospital for a week. Um, and I, I had gotten down to sort of skeletal proportions. It was really scary. Um, I was all dehydrated and depleted and um, had a really rough time my first year, which was um, 2003, because the doctors didn't seem to know what to do with me. They had sort of rubber stamped me type 2 because of my age, but even to me, who was a newbie, that didn't make sense. Um, and they then pretty quickly took me off the orals and put me on insulin, but they had me on far too much insulin in the beginning because I was in this sort of honeymoon period. So I literally felt like I was having a nervous breakdown after every meal, you know, shaking, getting heart palpitations, and, you know, it was, it was really frightening, especially when I had small children to take care of and was afraid to, you know, get in the car with them, um, among other things. So, I mean, I just at some point sort of had it and said, I just, I can't live like this. It's just, there's got to be a better way. And that's sort of what started me on my journey of becoming, an, you know, a, a patient advocate and a, and a so-called empowered patient. Um, and so what was it that inspired you to start up DiabetesMind.com? Well, so at the time when I was diagnosed um, in 2003, as you know, there was no such thing as health social media. Um, I felt like most people, when they get blindsided by some chronic illness, you know, I felt this terrible sense of isolation. And like nobody around me really understood what I was going through. And I had so many questions. And I just felt like the, you know, the floor had, the rug had been pulled out from underneath me. And I needed some grounding. I needed to find some people to connect with. So, you know, I was already um, very internet oriented. I was a writer and I did a lot of stuff on the web. So, of course, I went to the web looking for that help. And at that time, I didn't find it. Um, there was, there were no networks to connect with other patients. There were a few sort of chat forums um, that I found kind of difficult to penetrate, but mainly um, what I found were just, you know, thousands and thousands of sort of medical articles and, and sort of, you know, formal websites that really didn't address any of my real life concerns about living with this illness. So I sort of, had, you know, had the impetus to sort of start up the website that I had been looking for myself. And I was actually very fortunate because the year 2004 was pretty much when blogging software was really introduced to the mainstream. Um, the, uh, a company called Six Apart introduced something called TypePad, and um, you know, shortly after that, it, WordPress came out and whatnot. So suddenly, there was this tool to self-publish on the web, and I just thought, well, I'm just going to do this as a hobby. It was a side thing. You know, at the time, I think I found maybe four or five other people anywhere in the world who were doing a blog on diabetes. You know, the whole notion of a blog was such a new thing at the time. Um, but I just decided I would start up my own little publication and write about my experiences and also kind of put on my journalist hat and treat diabetes like my beat and just start kind of reporting on things that I was learning and different issues. And what I didn't, you know, what I didn't expect was to learn so much from the, the people who came to the site to interact with me that they would be such an amazing source and it became this fantastic dialogue. So it, the, the site, DiabetesMind.com, is actually a play on words for, um, you know, it, it's mine, I'm stuck with it, <laughs> and yeah. um, the notion of kind of a gold mine of straight talk and encouragement for people who are, who are touched by diabetes. And uh, what improvements would you like to see in medical devices for diabetes patients? Because I know you're quite keen on there being some improvement. What, what yes, I've become, become, that's a really core platform for advocacy that I have definitely jumped on and, and tried to further the cause of, of seeing medical devices be much improved. What I would like them to, to do, and they are moving in that direction, is to start envisioning these devices as life devices. So, you know, there are these amazing consumer electronics out there. You know, you, you think 
Apple and iPad and iPhone and, and the amazing sleek design and, you know, the ease of use and the sort of consumer appeal that those products have. And there is no reason why medical devices, you know, shouldn't be made with the same priorities and the same aesthetics. Um, you know, this, I wrote this um, open letter to Steve Jobs back in 2007, which started up this whole conversation um, and it got, you know, picked up all over the blogosphere and in the mainstream media about pushing the, di the diabetes world to design these devices. I mean, we have these things literally attached to our bodies 24-7, you know, a day and they go with us everywhere. And there's no reason why they shouldn't be smaller, sleeker, more comfortable, more easy to use, more personalizable, you know, sure. uh, there's, there are in many ways still designed for a clinical setting. And, you know, thankfully, so many patients now are not laid up in hospitals, you know, there's this whole new notion of survivorship. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we're out there having these, you know, busy, active lives, and we want these, sure. these devices to sort of, you know, be designed for that. Um, and what's your experience been of working with the pharma industry? Well, so <laughs> there are a lot of good people inside these monolithic firms, you know, who yeah. really do care and are trying to do the right thing. I think yeah. it's been, um, you know, typically this huge divide between these sort of, you know, kind of corporate giants and then these sort of, you know, know-nothing patients out there who didn't never in the past really had access and felt very exploited by these companies. I mean, I think we still, the patient community still has sort of a love-hate relationship with the pharma industry mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, we appreciate so much the medicines that they make and the devices that keep us alive. And at the same time, we do feel exploited and, and you know, the, the marketing is overly aggressive and that their, you know, their pricing policies are maybe not always in patient's best interests and whatnot. But from my experience, you know, working more and more closely with pharma companies, um, there are, you know, great people in these firms, again, who really do care and who want to do the right thing. And I think that we're luckily in an era in which um, you know, the, these social media and these tools have sort of, you know, brought down these walls or breaking down these walls so that we these communities can get to know each other better and that yeah. the, the human side of these companies can start to come out and, um, and hopefully that will help them design better products for us and it will help us you know, have a better experience um, leaning on them. And are there ways in which you think the pharma industry could better interact with patient groups or would you just like to see more increased interaction? Well, I think they are doing better, and again, um, you know, a huge part of that is that social media has, you know, sort of opened up this channel, this two-way dialogue that never existed before, and there are a number of companies, um, you know, obviously I'm keenly uh, involved in the, in the diabetes slice of the pie, but I know there are a number of companies that are, you know, doing a better and better job of, you know, interacting directly with, um, you know, the patient community in particular, the influencers who are really active online, you know, like myself and my peers. And I can give you an example. Um, Roche Diabetes Care here in the United States, uh, a couple of years ago, they actually came to me and my partner and I had a little consulting firm on the side where we were working with um, some big pharma companies and also some smaller device companies. Um, but Roche came to us and said, you know, we, we see that there's this really active group of online advocates in the diabetes world, um, and we want to connect with those people better. How can we kind of build a bridge to this patient community? So my partner and I suggested that they actually host a summit, kind of like a press day that, you know, the, that is done in other industries, and basically bring these bloggers in, you know, at, for kind of a day of dialogue, and so that they actually had a chance to get to know each other because we were all over the country and in some cases yeah. all over the world. And also so that we could sort of confront this company about the things that, you know, that are upsetting to us and just really give them a dose of, you know, kind of real patient concerns. So I think it was, it was actually, you know, I, I, brave of them. I give them kudos for taking the risk and inviting us in in 2009, and I think there was about 30 people that they brought in, and it was a kind of contentious the first year because a lot of people had all this sort of pent-up anger about pharma industry and what it has done wrong in the past, but I think it was a really productive um, interaction, and we've yeah. kept up that relationship with that Roche group, and um, it's actually their AccuCheck team, and they've hosted this summit now for several years in a row, and they've also kind of kept up the relationship with the um, patient community by having uh, quarterly uh, kind of conference calls, webinars, where they interact with us and talk to us about patient concerns. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you that not only did they bring us in, I mean, 
we we gave them, you know, strong input that it couldn't just be a marketing event. They cannot just bring us in there to give us presentations about their products and whatnot. That's not what this is about. This is about understanding, you know, real patient needs and concerns. And they were actually very receptive. They listened to us. I mean, one of the first things that happened in that first summit is when we walked in the door and we all looked around at these posters on the wall, they had these big advertisements. And, of course, it was these sort of smiling, happy people holding these glucose meters with perfect numbers on them. (laughs) And we all said, this is ridiculous. It's a bunch of actors, and they always have these perfect numbers, and that's not realistic, and it upsets people because we don't always get those perfect numbers. And also, it's the whole idea is that your glucose meter is a tool that sort of helps you identify, you know, where you are so that you know what to do next. So, you know, it's okay to show that people do get high numbers and low numbers, and that, thank goodness, they have that tool to to tell them where they are. So... In any case, based on our feedback, when we came back the next year, they had actually changed their um, advertising campaign uh, to use real patients instead of actors, and they actually showed much more realistic kind of scenes, you know, so I I think, you know, good for them. I think that's something that will be very impactful, and they listen to us. Um, You know, so that's an example, and actually this whole um, event and interaction was so successful that the competitors are kind of following suit. So Medtronic, um, Medtronic Diabetes hosted their first sort of social media forum mm-hmm. for a group of, of online uh, activists uh, last April. And so they brought in about 40 people, actually. Yeah. And I know that um, J&J's Animus is actually getting very involved in um, interacting directly with patient bloggers and patient leaders. So, you know, a number of companies are really doing – I think a much better job, and again, it's sort of facilitated by social media to, to identify who these people are and then reach out to them and, you know, try to have some real interaction with them and actually listen to their concerns. Um, and do you think there are ways that the farm industry can improve how they're perceived generally? Well, I think, you know, getting, again, getting into social media can really help as long as they're doing it right. So, you know, having that transparency and authenticity, not just using it as a place to blast out more marketing messages. Mm -hmm. And what it allows is for them to have their real people, you know, reach out to patient groups. And I, I really think it does a world of good for, you know, us to see the faces behind the logos. Um, you know, there's a line that we had included in this, um, video that I had done for, um, uh, for the American Diabetes Association uh, annual conference a couple of years ago, the line is, um, people don't trust institutions, people trust people. Yeah. So, you know, patients, I, I think, you know, I know that I feel much better about these companies, um, you know, as the more I get to know the individuals behind them and, you know, what kind of people they are, um, that makes me feel like, you know, they're, they have a heart <laughs> and that they, you know, that they're not just sort of this money-making machine. I think that's incredibly important, in, in, you know, it, probably in any industry, but so much more in, in healthcare and medicine, because you're talking about people who are suffering from a really debilitating, expensive, horrible, <laughs> burdensome illness, you know, not just diabetes, but other conditions as well. And, you know, having the sense that, you know, this, these companies are just sort of trying to steamroll us with, um, you know, with their messaging and get us to buy more and more stuff is just upsetting. Yeah, so, cool. you know, I think that social media, you know, might seem like a a threat to some companies because they're worried that, you know, someone might post something negative. But really, it's a huge opportunity for them to kind of reinvent themselves as more responsive, caring organizations. And what other resources and support do you think would be helpful for patients with diabetes that aren't currently available that would help motivate patients with diabetes to help manage their disease? Well, I really, you know, again, this is my passion and the thing that I'm most involved in is the, is the online world, the online community, and I think it's growing richer and richer every day. But, you know, there are so many patients out there who are still not aware of it or taking advantage of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in my opinion, I mean, nothing is more motivating than seeing others, other people like you who are actually, you know, living the good life with this illness, you know, who are actually doing it, they're succeeding, you know, and being able to to connect with those people and get their support to sort of cheer you on and also to just answer those, you know, real-world questions that you have about, you know, the logistics of living with this disease or, you know, 
the side effects you may be experienced on a certain treatment. I mean, that's information that no healthcare provider can give you unless they're actually living with this illness and having, you know, walked the walk themselves. Yeah. You know, that's only the kind of information you get from other people who share the experience of living every day of their lives with the same condition. So finally, what would your take-home message be to, um, and your key message to the industry? How do you think it can better p- meet patient needs? Well, I mean, I guess the mantra is, you know, listen, listen, listen. Yeah. I feel like um, the industry spent decades essentially ignoring patients. So it has a lot of catching up to do, you know. Oh. And I think they need to, you know, we're in a new era of partnership. I think they need to respect and utilize patients, you know, more as partners. Yeah. And, in fact, kind of this whole e-patient revolution move, you know, the, 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 um, it's kind of a movement, and, and the, the motto there is, you know, let patients help. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's mainly a message that's geared towards healthcare providers, but for pharma, the same thing is true. Again, only patients know the experience of living on these drugs and devices, so let them help you, you know, understand what the priorities are, what the messaging should be, you know, maybe what the future should look like in terms of roadmap. Well, Amy, thank you very much for your time. Of course, thank you for having me. PharmaForum.com is the dynamic online information and discussion portal for the pharmaceutical industry.